Good morning, good morning, good morning. <clears throat> it's that time of day again. Off to work. I like these mornings because the uh, the light is good for filming. When the... Oh, look at all those trees over there. Can you, can you see how they cut all those trees down over there? A lot of wood there. Enough to power my home for the next 20 years probably. And do you know what's going to happen to it? They're going to burn the lot. They're going to stick it all on a big bonfire. And over the course of about 24 hours, because it burns all night, they're just going to, the whole lot's going to go up in flames. That's uh, one of the sort of weird things about the country. There's all sorts of, uh, you know, when you, you live in a town, you have a funny idea about how things work. And uh, so, for example, I mean, you know, we live in apple country where in the autumn they pick the apples and then probably, I would say, half as many as they pick just then fall off the trees and lie on the ground. Nothing, nothing really wrong with them, you know, other than the fact that it's, uh, they're over, over productive. Probably not the right shape or size or what the, what the supermarkets want. So they just pick the best two thirds. I had a guy uh, come up to my farm. Well, it's an ex farm. It's not a farm, mate. It's, a, it's called. It's called. Uh, I can't tell you what it's called. Don't even ask. Anyway, I had a guy come up to my uh, house and ask. Uh, and say like you know where is the where is the place that we can pick up free apples and I said there isn't such a place doesn't exist and he goes oh yeah 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 he says it like it's an app where you uh, if anyone knows where there's any sort of uh, unpicked fruit or surplus fruit then uh, you can go and just uh, get help yourself some you know so I said basically that's you know you start doing that round here, you are you're going to be you're going to end up in a in a wicker man. Unbelievable! You know why they do that? They just come round because they expect me to veer off the road over to the left there because the the lines are a bit wider, and so they think that you're going to just go and bust somebody's front door just so that they can force their way through. So anyway, I had a tree with some apples on it that I wasn't gonna pick, so I let him have a couple of carrier bags full, but the problem is the <clears throat> modern technology brings modern nuisances in a way because these apps like what three words, which allow you to specify a a small grid it's got a, a small grid system where you, with any with just three words you can specify a sort of a, a car park size space anywhere on the face of the earth and um, <coughs> but um, which is great you know if you're on the Dartford moors and you've broken your leg and you need an air, air ambulance then they can fly straight to you can't they uh, but if you're um, using an app and you say like there is a tree full of apples that nobody seems to um, be care about or uh, hazelnuts or cobnuts in my case got two nice cobnut trees we never see a cobnut off of them um, then uh, people can go exactly to that tree can't they using the same coordinate system. So, and, and let me tell you, like, if you don't live in the country, right, and you drive past something in the country and you think, oh, look at that, that tree, look, it's standing on somewhere no, in the middle of nowhere, and it's got walnuts on it or something, and that'll be, and 
they're, they're just right, right for picking and well, it wouldn't be a shame if they all went to waste, right? The, the, there is not a thing, there is not a leaf in the country, right, that somebody hasn't got an interest in. And I mean the owner, the, the owner of the tree, okay? Speaking as the owner of a walnut tree that quite frequently has to chase people off it, your, um, you spend all year watching it, cutting the grass around it, <laughs> And then seeing the walnuts ripen up and then thinking I'll go out and pick them on Saturday or Sunday and then finding out that some bugger on Thursday or Friday has had the lot and uh, it, it, it's very frustrating and very I, I get you know all the things that get me stressed it's one of the top ten I would say to the point where I've actually had uh, a CCTV put up on that tree and it's called Walnut Cam and uh, we watch it every year to see uh, who's going to have a go and lots of, I mean to give you an idea of who's tried to pick the walnuts off it right one year was an old guy who uh, came along with a couple of bags on a bicycle and was picking them all and I said to him what do you think you're doing and he says oh uh, you know, I saw this tree here and it didn't seem like it belonged to anyone. And I said, yeah, it does, it belongs to me. But everything, unless it's common land, in which case it usually belongs to the parish council and you can't pick stuff. Every tree, every leaf belongs to someone in the country, okay? <coughs> and where I am, a lot of the apple trees aren't really fenced off. So the excuse that it's not behind a fence is not, uh, it's not tenable in the country. But a lot of the country is not behind a fence, you know? And it would be a shame if, if it was. If, uh, you know, everywhere you went, there were just fences everywhere. And perhaps that's how it will end up. But I said to him, look, I said, you can't have these, you know? These belong to the person who owns the tree, i.e. me. And he was a lovely old boy, but he said, he said, oh, but I've cycled five miles to get here. You know, and I said, well, I thought, well, you'll have to cycle five miles to get back to wherever you come from then, won't you? Because I don't, I'm not giving away walnuts to people for cycling achievements. So we had a bag off of him. Then the next year, the bloody um, owner turned up. The, the bloke I bought the house off and the land dead now rest his soul but and I don't know probably uh, I don't know what he thought he was doing and he's out there picking these walnuts and I went out to I recognized him of course because I, I thought you're the bloke I bought this house off and he went out there and he said uh, he was picking them and he said uh, I said what are you doing he said oh he, he said to me I planted this tree, you know. And it was a sort of a comment that came from a bloke who was uh, near the end of his life, you know, and looking back over his life and... Uh, hello, bird up there. And, and a bit sad about, you know, all these memories and stuff like that. And that did get to me a bit. And, and I said to him, look, you know, if you want to come over here, I, and, I, and I thought to myself, and nick some walnuts, but I said, you know, and have some walnuts, then, uh, you know, I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna stop you. If you want a few walnuts off your old tree that you planted, then that's fine. What I didn't say was that, uh, you know, you, I don't know whether you remember, but <laughs> 12 years ago, you sold this farm to someone for a large wadge of money uh, and that included the rights to buy the, to get the walnuts off the tree. And that's what you got the money for, the ability to, because you lost the ability to, to pick the walnuts. <laughs> but I didn't say that. I didn't say that because I'm not in it. <laughs> oh God. And then, but usually it's just a bunch of 
local uh, farm workers and, and by which I mean young kids you know in their teens 20s and they jump out where there's two boys and two girls or something they all start picking the walnuts and putting them in their bags and everything and you have to be quick because they're only there for about 10 minutes at the most 20 minutes and I had to go out just as Farmer Giles you know with my cap on and my barber and my green wellies and say what the hell do you're doing and they always say the same thing oh we we thought we didn't think this tree belonged to anyone so I need to uh, get a sign that says this tree belongs to me <laughs> or, or bugger off <laughs> bugger off my land or something you know because it's a, it's a problem every year and it wouldn't be a problem if it wasn't such a brilliant walnut tree the walnuts are the size of your fist you know they really are it really is an overperforming walnut tree it really does love where it is and and its life and it rewards me by producing these massive walnuts um, which are Jug Lands Regia, I think, quite rare. Uh, it's not, a, it's not a common tree, the walnut tree, in the UK. Especially not a mature one that's been there like possibly 50, 60 years. All right, Dover traffic. So, the big news at the moment, what's the big news at the moment? Well, I mean, we've had COVID on the, the radio and the TV for a year now. I mean, literally, all the time, all day, every day, you know, COVID, lockdown, virus, vaccine, that's that's all you need to go on and say and uh, anything that changes that happen sort of really really um, slowly there's no great it's not like it's a fast evolving situation it's just the whole country's been under virtual house arrest everybody's still under house arrest it's still you're still getting into big trouble for uh, going out you're not you're not supposed to leave your house unless it's for uh, to shop to, to go to a medical service to get vaccinated obviously or um, or because you, you quite literally can't work from home well about 10 million people have been uh, vaccinated and they don't have the facilities to vaccinate everybody on schedule by which I mean with any drug you do you test it and you test it with a certain dose that's given at certain intervals and then it's given a product license based on the tests that are submitted and you're then not supposed to administer it in in a, in a completely different way you know like if it's if it's licensed for intravenous injection you're not supposed to give it as a suppository and if it says, uh, you know, uh, one gram a day, you're not supposed to give it uh, five grams a day or one gram a month or something. You know, you have to stick to the rules. Well, the problem is it's been licensed in a way that is impossible to administer because they just don't have the staff or the doses. So where well, I've had the Pfizer jab and I'm supposed to have another jab in three weeks. And there's no way I can have that. It'll probably be near six weeks. And so what the government does is, when, when it can't uh, do what it's supposed to do, it um, invents the evidence to demonstrate that what it can do is actually legal and proper. And, and if they can add on quite a good idea, then... Um, that's what they do they just set about changing moving the goalposts all the time so <coughs> so let's assume that you've got sort of two or three different types of viruses and I don't just mean different manufacturers I mean viruses that work in quite different ways you know the Pfizer vaccine is a messenger RNA virus the uh, the other ones are, are quite different oh see the lorries 
see the lorries off to the right there they're all queuing up to go into Dover so what's going to happen is that nobody's going to get the second dose on time and it's quite possible that um, <coughs> that the second dose it's, it might be a different vaccine you might so you might get one Pfizer uh, mRNA and then you might get another vaccine of another type <coughs> excuse me so what the government's doing is it's engaging in the uh, process of trying to uh, um, come up with research that shows that uh, possibly one dose is all you need you know that you get we were thinking about 90% protection after two doses but no new research has come to light that says that uh, possibly yeah goodbye farewell have a nice trip <coughs> that um, that you might say get 90 percent uh, dose after uh, protection after one dose <coughs> then uh, and also what they need is research that shows that uh, if you have two doses that uh, it doesn't really matter that it's not it wasn't at the recommended interval say three weeks <coughs> And then uh, another bit of research, another research strand is concentrated on making sure that uh, we've, we get some research that shows if you have one vaccine for the first dose and then a completely different and unrelated vaccine for the second dose, that that's uh, not so bad either, you know, and that you might be, <clears throat> well, let's put it this way. First of all, they need to prove that it's safe. Secondly, they would like to prove that it's equally effective. And thirdly, and the cherry on the cake, they would like to prove it's actually more effective. And in fact, the fact that they uh, can't do what they promised has uh, been a good thing. That inadvertently produced a bonus. Um, whether it will or not, I don't know. But the point is, I think they'll treat it as though it has. So, and you get this a lot with government. People actually don't understand how government works. At the moment, there's an um, inquiry going on into uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, not not real cryptocurrencies, but basically digitised representations of the national currencies, like the pound and the dollar. People are being invited to, uh, you know, make representations on on a digital pound, which would would be worth a dig one digital pound would be the same as one. Uh, normal pound, you know, pound in your pocket, as uh, Harold Wilson would say. From now on, the pound abroad is worth 14% or so less in terms of other currencies. That doesn't mean, of course, that the pound here in Britain, in your pocket or purse or in your bank, has been devalued. And um, Ken Weech, who was the parliamentary advisor, he was the one who came up with a story about uh, feeding your horse a bit less every day is a good policy until the horse dies. He also said that the government never holds an inquiry before they know the result. And uh, you know this is this is <laughs> see that absolutely massive <laughs> six foot five <laughs> Plug looks like a boxer standing there muscles in his spit. And he's got a dog the size of a Satsuma on a lead. That was funny. Anyway. So, so, and this was the case with the dental inquiries, you know, when the Kenneth Bloomfield and things like that, that, that I gave, uh, and the Jimmy Steele inquiries, that I gave evidence to personally. <clears throat> They knew, and the Scarrett inquiry into into VT. Um, what else? There have been a few other prominent inquiries. But take Bloomfield, for example. I mean, uh, Mawinney was the minister, or Secretary of State for Health, or I think it's the Secretary of State, not the minister. 
or it might have been Virginia Bottomley was the uh, secretary and when he was the minister. Anyway, it doesn't matter. The point was that um, they wanted to nobble the dental profession. And uh, so they decided what they wanted. Um, I think it was to deregulate corporate bodies. I'm not at all sure. It's all a blur now. It's all a, it's all a matter of record anyway. But the point was that um, but when he was an Irishman and uh, Northern Irish and uh, when we went to talk to Ken Bloomfield who had been appointed to hold the inquiry into whether it was a good idea it was noticeable that he, he also had a very strong Northern Irish accent <laughs> and it occurred to us that perhaps <laughs> per chance the two men knew each other and had possibly been chums for a while and this might have possibly influenced Mawinney's choice of Bloomfield as the person to hold the inquiry and write the report. And the thing about writing the report is that it does not matter, matter, it does not matter if all the evidence, all the submitted evidence, all the submissions are to the contrary, it's the text in the report that is, is affected. In other words, not affected, exactly, not, absolutely not affected, effected, put into effect. <clears throat> because basically what, what uh, Mawinney gave Bloomfield was a license to uh, make a bunch of recommendations, which uh, Mawinney may or may not have discussed with him in advance obviously probably did because they would have said what the government was trying to achieve and uh, Sir Kenneth Bloomfield um, could, can, can, can write a report and, and can, which can quite blatantly obviously go against the, the thrust of the submissions but um, who reads the submissions? Who cares about the submissions? Once the report's been published, who is, can protest effectively about the fact that that Bloomfield's brain was obviously in in neutral, and that he didn't come up with a, a report that was that represented the evidence that was put before him? <coughs> a report is just a license to do what you like, and as um, you know, as as uh, we've said, you know the result was in before the race was run and I think that's the same with the with the vaccines you know so it's just the way things work so anyway it's been a pleasure oh that's the windscreen wipers <laughs> get the hang of this driving thing sometime all right I'll talk to you soon bye